<clears throat> what's happening what's really good good morning good monday good afternoon good evening good wherever you are and wherever you are in the world welcome back to the agostino zinga show episode number 140 with me your host agostino zinga how's it going how you feeling huh how you feeling over there Hope you guys are well, well hydrated, well rested, well lubricated. You know, you've got all your mobility in one place. You know, you can uh, bring your knees up to your chest. You know, you can do that thing where you bend your, put your hand in between your shoulder blades and push your elbow back. Hope you can do all those amazing things. Hope you can hold a broomstick in between your hands, um, like you're holding a barbell, and then swing it around your back without bending your elbows. All that good mobility stuff. Hope you are, hope you're good. We're back again, man. Another weekend has just flown by, right? For you people out there who are weekend warriors, who are kind of, you know, I don't envy that um, perspective whatsoever. Looking forward to the weekend. That's like, you know, that's one of my night, that's one of my recurring living nightmares. Whenever I have those, you know, whenever I have those moments, they, they ha it happens in life sometimes, isn't it? When you have those moments where you think, you know what, why don't I just like relax and just be like a regular schmegular dude, right? Don't upload podcasts. Um, don't DJ. Uh, don't write on a blog, uh, don't take pictures, don't do all this extracurricular stuff here. Why don't I just like get a job, put my head down and just relax and chill, right? The one thing that recurs into me is that number one, it, would, it wouldn't be me, all right? That's not something I can do as a person. I'm not, I, I don't operate well in that zone. And number two, I'm scared of turning into that dude who looks forward to Wednesdays because he knows the next day is going to be Thursday, which means that there might be like a, a gallery opening or a private view. There might be a store launch or a product launch or something in store. Or they might be serving free drinks, which would then easily lead on to the Friday, which means that it's the end of the week and you can get hammered again and Saturday and Sunday. I don't want to be that guy. So as, as alluring as that, you know, safe, comfortable life is to some people, the 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 cons the cons I see with it far away the pros. There are some pros of it, right? There is there is something quite um nice about waking up and knowing that you know you've got your stable job you've got your stable income you've got a nice group of friends and things just keep going along right you just keep motoring just keep one day is the same one day is the same it might be little peaks here and there but for the most part you just consistent you're just trying to make sure you're maintaining that consistent level there is comfort in that don't get me wrong and it's something that i don't look down upon there's some people are a little bit like yeah i can never do that that regular shmega life is boring no it's not boring it's just different right um wherever that's wherever whatever experience that is for people I don't have the context with it because it's not something I'm going through. But wherever it is, they enjoy it. Fair enough. But for me, I can't do it, man. I can't be that guy. I have to. I have to kind of do the thing that I'm doing now, which kind of doesn't really make much sense, really, in it. But you know, for me personally, this is what makes me feel alive. So yeah, weekends for me are just like any other day. I really don't really look forward to them or despise them any sort of way. If anything, the one day that I do love, which is um, something that again isn't common with most people, is I love Mondays, man. It's such a good chance to reset, right? And just keep and go back to basics and just re-examine and know where you want to be um, by the end of the week. Because sometimes with me anyway, especially when I'm trying to figure out a diet plan, figure out a workout plan, I can sometimes lose my head in between the weeks, right? I think, oh, fuck, you know, Saturday's so far away for a cheat meal, right? But I always try to, I always try and future project how I'm going to feel on the Monday when I know I've done like a solid seven days of strict dieting and strict working out i know i'm gonna feel amazing so um i've been looking forward to this monday for a while because i've had like a bit of a crazy christmas new year's and kind of leaping into this um new year's week i've had a little bit of a crazy one where my diet hasn't been that good but my workout's been great so i've been working out basically five days a week six days a week seven days a week right for the most part well between two five to seven days a week but obviously my diet hasn't been where it needs to be and obviously as anyone would know with working out you know, 90% of your gains are going to come from the things that you eat, right? You can't out-train a bad diet, as people say. Some people can, I think, but those people that can do that are the same people that have just have fast metabolisms, right? Um, food just kind of runs through them. It doesn't really stick anywhere for the most part. I think you can kind of get away with that. You see people do those kind of things, right, where they kind of make sure that um, the, calorie, the calories that they're burning far exceeds the calories that they're eating. So you can kind of get away with maybe eating a whole pizza and then working out because you know you're going to quote-unquote burn it all off. But me personally, I know it doesn't work because number one, in the, on the pro side of it, I put on muscle very easily. So if I start weight training, I can see the gains. Even doing push-ups, if I do like 50 push-ups in a week, right, I can already start feeling my, my chest changing, right? 
So that's one thing. But then on the negative side of it, when I start eating shit, um, I can also start feeling I'm getting heavier and heavier every day. Like my the weight just piles on really quickly. So I'm, I'm not, I've got the, I'm not sure what that means in terms of how I digest stuff, but from in general, I just can't get away with eating what I want and still working out and hoping that it's going to work. It doesn't really work for me in that respect. So um, to Monday, as we sit today here, is my chance to kind of reset. The plan is to kind of go full keto for the whole week and then have a cheat day on a Saturday. So I'm going to go um, Monday to Friday, kind of like making sure it's all tight. And then I'm going to be fasting for 16 hours of the day. So today I had my breakfast at 9 in the morning. I'm going to have a lunch dinner around 2 to 3 p.m. I'm going to have a little something snack between like 4 and 5 and then kind of fast from there all the way until the next morning and do that again until the end of the week. Um, and then see where I'm at in terms of weight-wise. The goal is to kind of get myself down to... I want to get down to at least 200, so I want to lose about 25 to 30 pounds by the next three months or so, which is easily achievable if I stick to the diet. But I think, like I said before, I think I said before a couple of times with goals, what I like to I like to break them down into bite-sized bits, or not, well, I like to have an end goal and then kind of step backwards and work my way back in terms of how I'm going to start from you know day zero sort of thing. So what I want to do is I want to give myself a week framework. And this week framework that I'm going to give myself of seven days, it's going to tell my, I'm going to, I want to tell myself, look, you've done it once, just copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste. But I need to have seven days of doing it. Seven days of doing it in my memory bank, right? It's going to be in my, um, you know, whatever it's called. Uh, you know, when you have your, it's going to be in my muscle memory. So then when it comes to the next week, I'm going to know exactly what to do. I'm just going to copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste, and just continue going until the calendar months reach free. And then from there, I should be where I need to be, but... If I can, I'm, the aim is to lose 25 to 30 pounds. I currently am about 225, 225 to, yeah, about 225, 227. Right now in the moment, I'm going to round up to 230 just to be like nice to myself. But I'm about 225. If I can get down to at least 210, the low, the kind of like, you know, that's the, what my, my goal is. But stretch goal is to get like, you know, in the 200s, 201, 202 by the end of March. I think before Christmas, when I was training quite hard and doing my stuff really well, I think in the start of December, I was like 217, 215. And, that, and that, the diet was loose, but it wasn't as strict as I'm doing it now. And I was working out quite well. So if I, if I kind of ramp up the diet and continue working how I was working before, I should the, the weight should kind of eventually fall off. And then the uh, overall goal for the rest of the year is just to maintain that weight. Whatever weight I am by the end of March, I just want to ma maintain it for the whole of the year because I know when I drop down to 108, 180 sorry when i was um working in dr martin's back in the day it was great i looked amazing close fitted amazing but it was probably a little bit of an unmanageable weight for me i think in a, in the long run just because it requires me to work out so much in order to change it again i think long term it's something i'm gonna have to commit to and make sure that i keep on top of because I, I can't be always around the 200 mark it should be i should be like a comfortable walking 190 190 pounds that should, that should be me overall especially considering my frame and my height and stuff but I need to kind of build up a base and hopefully get there by the end of the month. And then, um, of course, add on top of that, I'm doing loads of races. I'm running a bunch. Um, in terms of workout, I'm just doing the same thing that I usually do for the most part. Um, I, I, I always go by the adage that I heard someone, I think it was John Warborn or somebody else, one of the CrossFit legend dudes, said something along the lines of, um, don't pick harder don't pick harder workouts just work really hard with the workouts you already have right like go full metal with it so you know oh people always trying to find that perfect program to get down to this to get abs to get this to get that it's not the perfect program it's already the program that you have already but just ramp it up a little bit intensity wise so like even when training today i did three miles today i was a bit groggy a bit loot bit kind of like just dodgy because of all the shit i've been eating over the weekend but I was still able to crank it out and just kind of power through the last mile and a half, really go full pelt and try to run as fast as I can. Same if I was in the gym, try and, you know, go as hard as I can, really hard, no no kind of getting distracted, put on a playlist and just kind of bang it out. Don't touch the phone again until you finish sort of thing. So go really, really hard intensity and then you should be where you need to be. So that's the kind of plan I have for the week overall. But yeah, apart from that, what I did in the weekend, as per usual, I DJed at Tap East um, on Friday, which was a great Nice to be back there after the whole New Year shenanigans. That was nice as well to kind of get back in that zone. Everyone hanging out. Um, for the most part, you know, nothing really... It's funny, when you go to a bar or a pub, you realise... Um, I think um, in the mornings, during the morning commute, I think what you realise usually, especially in the New Year, I, only for me, maybe because I look for these kind of things, but you do see people doing little things that they've probably never done before, right? 
So there might be a person on the train who hasn't got their headphones in or isn't looking at their phone because they're committed to like not looking at their phone in the morning. There might be somebody reading a book because they decided to read a book more often, blah, blah. You might see someone taking a stair instead of going on a lift because they want to get a little bit of exercise and they're going into work. You see little changes people are kind of trying to make in their everyday life, right? You might, even with running in the morning, I might see a couple more joggers I don't usually see, blah, 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 blah. But what you see, what you don't see in a pub is change. It just, it's the same thing again and again. You see the same characters, the same people having a drink after work on a Friday and then going home, right? It's just that, that's something that doesn't really change for the most part in, in, um, in pubs and pubs, which is, which is probably part of this magic. Something I don't really look down upon. I'm not, I'm not that person because at the end of the day, I mean, I am in the quote unquote service, hospitality, nightlife industry. So, you know, as a DJ, so I kind of have the, the people are, are my bread and butter, so I can't disparage it. But it's interesting when you're in a bar, you realize people, some people just, some things just don't change in a bar, right? If someone needs a drink after work, you know what I mean? It is what it is. So, um, yeah, I did that on the Friday. And then Saturday, I had a last minute gig at the Star of Bethnal. First time I've DJed there, actually. No, actually, I DJed there before previously. I DJed in the past. But when I DJed, if you've been to the Star of Bethnal before in Bethnal Green, um, the DJ booth used to be next to the door. As you came in on the right hand side, underneath under the stairs, it used to be like a, a a DJ booth there. But now they've moved it. They've moved the DJ booth to the other side, to that kind of next to the window. And that where the DJ booth used to be under the stairs is now turned into like a little. Um, it looks like a little, uh, you know, those kind of rooms that you close the door and you sit down with your mate inside with a table, or whatever you can sit down in, which is quite cool. I'm not sure if you can smoke there or something because I saw some girls going in there and wearing jackets and shit, which is quite interesting. So it's, it turns into a little room that you can sit in down. So it's quite cool. So I I played I played like a little disco brunch set from about two to half five, which was quite sick. Option to kind of play, you know, a low kind of like frequency, sort of like chill out y kind of vibe of a party, whatever it may be. And just to kind of be good background music, right? Because in those kind of settings, again, like you said, you can't really go too hard. You can't pump out fucking deep house or techno and shit. You kind of have to be a bit more, well, you can do deep house, but you have to do it tasteful and in, in a low way. And one thing that you realize what quite quickly or something that I've kind of learned over these last few years, especially after reading loads of interviews of DJs and stuff and following podcasts and that sort of shit. Because, you know, when I get into when I get into these kind of things, I get into it hard. So I follow these guys. I, I take notes. I understand what they're doing. I try and apply it to my DJ sets. So one thing that I do a lot when I play in those kind of places is um, volume control. Volume control is one of those kind of secret cheat codes that I've learned over the years that's really kind of elevated the way I play. Um, effectively what you're doing is that you're ensuring that everyone has a good night but you're making sure that the when you come in you're playing at a certain level a certain tempo and as the night progresses you're slowly inching it up without people realizing it but i don't ever want to get to a point where anyone realizes that it's too loud i want them to kind of be all right because i've always been in a bar you know, have you ever been in a bar sometimes where you're just hanging out with your friends chilling having a chat, catching up, you know, just busting joke, whatever it may be, and some fucking DJ comes on and just starts cranking the tunes out, like, at kind of, you know, level 10 for the a moment he starts at 8 p.m. It's like, come on, dude, man. Have some, you know, have some decorum, like, start slow. But, boys, no, it's like foreplay, do you know what I mean? Like, come on, man, let's let's get, get me warmed up, do you know what I mean? Don't just go straight in if you're a girl, I'd say, right? So that's something that I've learned over time is that kind of volume control and how to kind of really ease into a set. And if anything, you do get, you're always going to get the opportunity anyway if you're playing from two to five because you're essentially playing for four hours, right? But it's still quite nice to have the ability to do it anyway, regardless, like to be able to do it. And obviously in the Star of Bethnal, it being a lot more of a busy pub or a lot more of a hipster friendly pub than maybe the Heathcote Star is in that respect. It was a good chance to see people and kind of gauge the atmosphere. Then from about 3 p.m., uh, a little party came in. Some girl had a birthday party and she kind of celebrated and people were there having a good time. It was funny seeing, you know, just I always, you know, I just there's always a part of me that looks at people that celebrate their birthdays in that kind of way, especially so soon after Christmas and New Year's. It's like, come on, man, what are you what are you putting your friends through? How many people on that table are broke and down to their last ten quid, and you're forcing them to come out to this fucking, um, you know, birthday event thing in Star Bethnal? But fair enough to her, though, the girl, because it isn't Star Bethnal. She could have done it in a fucking stupid Mayfair club somewhere and made people pay a 50 pound cover. But instead, you know, it's a regular bar. It's not that super expensive. They do quite good food there. You can kill two birds with one stone. It's in Bethnal Green. I'm assuming everyone lives around East so they can kind of get home really easily. So annoying, you can't really be mad at her. So they stayed for a while. They were getting crunked and loud. And it's just funny how how loud it gets in a bar when a, pot, when a, when a party comes. Um, obviously, like when, when a party of people come who's, who's reserved like a table in the corner, it gets super, super loud. So that was cool to see. 
And it ended there at 5.30 and then basically came back home, rested, chilled, watched a couple of FA Cup games and kind of took it a bit easy, really. But it's been a really good weekend at respect in terms of kind of, you know, answer where I want to be, in terms of this, this plan I had for the week. So after I dj I kind of already was thinking, okay, what I want to do, kind of my inside racing. And then now we are here and I'm kind of in the first day of my full body transformation. I've taken a couple of above body picks anyway as well, so... I'm going to be able to gloat later on on the social media worms and get my, you know, likes up on pictures, you know, when I saw my transformation pick, which will be, you know, it will be super easy to do because I'm sure uh, the weight will just kind of fall off me. But let's see how that journey progresses and I'll keep everyone else updated, podcast, YouTube-wise, about how that goes. But that's basically been my weekend for the most part. And, um, oh yeah, and counting the books I've read as well this week, I'm going to do a, a probably in tomorrow's podcast. I'll do like a little round up of all the books I read last year because I fucking count them all up and it's quite a hefty amount of books. So I'm going to run through that. So keep an eye out for that coming up very, very, very soon. Anyway, enough about me and my weekend. Let's get into some topics because that's what we're here for, isn't it? That is the name of the game. Got the coffee in hand and run through some topics here. And for a change, got some uh, honey too. So, you know, get that get that little bit of secrets running through. In the older uh, coffee realms. So, number one, millennials and burnout. So, um, this article I stumbled upon, I think probably on Twitter or something, um, written by BuzzFeed News, was quite interesting article uh, talking about uh, millennials and burnout. It's something I've kind of been a bit against and, you know, it's kind of annoyed me, especially when it comes to, like, YouTubers complaining about burnout in the whole YouTube landscape. Because it always seemed like to me, um, some of these people, well, to me, it seemed like, it seemed like some of the biggest YouTube stars were complaining they were having burnout, right? Because um, I guess the algorithm on YouTube changed and it kind of only rewarded people who were able to kind of churn out a lot of content uh, back to back to back. And also, I guess um, the user or the viewership, the you know, the kind of fan base had kind of grown to a level that they expected um, their favorite creators to upload very regularly, right? So the YouTube was having to kind of keep up with that pace, keep up with that momentum and that demand. And they all complained about burnout. They felt like they couldn't make any videos. Some of, YouTube, some of the biggest people had uploaded views in nine months and all that sort of stuff. And you know, YouTube is a fairly um, black and white uh, platform for the most part. You can see the frequency of people's uploads by just clicking on their profile and checking the uploads. You can see how often they upload stuff. And some people, you know, just disappear after a while after they reach a kind of, you know, uh, a kind of point they stop kind of creating after that. And they find it hard to create new things. But for me, it seemed a little bit disingenuous because it seemed as if some of these big YouTube stars, they kind of fought, you know, there was a lot of people who kind of, you know, were lauding and praising themselves, giving themselves pats on the back for being part of this new, like, digital media technology um, revolution, right? Which kind of, you know, usurped the conventional television platforms and people were heading over to YouTube to watch their stuff, Netflix, all these other streaming platforms. Um, they thought that was cool and they were ha happy to take all that, all that praise, but then they weren't very, they weren't aware of the level of work that's needed to kind of keep up, to keep that kind of fan base engaged. And the viewership that would watch television, the viewership that would watch YouTube videos is the same viewership, right? They still need that content. You know what, like EastEnders comes on what, nearly every, every other day, right? Someone has to film that, someone, the actors have to turn up, production crew. It's a lot of work that goes into making that thing. Now, taking, um, example of EastEnders and kind of doing it in a low budget way just filming your friends doing a drama on your iPhone or like on a digital camera in your area still requires the same amount of work it still requires the same amount of planning still requires the same amount of uh you know whatever it may be it still requires you to upload consistently all the time so sometimes it felt to me like the creators wanted to take all the praise for being part of this new media age, but weren't respond but weren't aware of the responsibility that it carried, weren't aware of the work that was required to kind of keep that going. And they kind of wanted the best of both worlds. They wanted to be able to upload stuff in their boxes lying at home, but they didn't want to be able to create they didn't well, they they weren't happy to be pushed to create more interesting content again and again and again. Because that's basically the name of the game, isn't it? I think Netflix has basically seen that, right? With the amount of shows that they've kind of put out, burned. Uh, dropped and then kind of regurgitate again pop more money in again if it didn't work out dropped it again like it's you have to keep going 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 if you want to keep this um user base engaged because even netflix they can't rest in their laurels because if a better service comes along that has better programming people will just jump ship straight away they won't be loyal to you whatsoever so these creators probably see the same sort of thing 
But I thought this article on BuzzFeed News sort of like spun it in a more interesting way and kind of gave me a lot of food for thought and kind of maybe a little bit more considerate of maybe the people's plight. But also, it did kind of get me a bit angry. So, the thing that got me a little bit angry here that I thought was kind of a little bit questionable was the opening statement. So this article is called How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation. It's on BuzzFeed News. It's written by a lady called Anne Helen Peterson, right? So this article here reads as follows. So there's an opening segment here that kind of uh, really kind of rankled me up the wrong way. I'll kind of get it up on the screen so people can see it. So this is the here, How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation. And I'll scroll down here to the opening statement that kind of really wrangled me, right? So it says here, I tried to register for the 2016 election, but it was beyond the deadline by the time I tried to do it. A man named Tim, age 27, explained to New York Magazine last fall. I hate my I hate mailing stuff. It gives me anxiety. Tim was outlining the reason why he, like 11 of, 11 other millennials interviewed by the magazine, probably wouldn't vote in the 2018 midterm election. The amount of work logically isn't that much, he continued. Fill out a form, mail it, go to a specific place on a specific day. But those kind of tasks can be hard for me to do if I'm not enthusiastic about it. <laughs> Tim goes on to admit that some friends have helped him register to vote and he planned to probably make it happen for the midterms. But his explanation, even though as he noted his struggles in this case was caused in part by his ADHD, triggered the contemporary tendency to dunk on millennials' inability to complete seemingly basic tasks. Grow up, the overall sentiment goes. Life is not that hard. So, this is the way the world ends, Huffington Post congressional reporter Matt Fuller tweeted. Not with a bang, but with a bunch of millennials who didn't know how to mail things. Explanations like Tim are the core of millennial reputation. We are spoiled, entitled, lazy, and failures are what's come to be known as an adulting, a world invented by millennials as a catch-all for the task of self-sufficient existence. Expressions of adulting do often come off as privileged astonishment at the realities of, well, life, that you have to pay the bills and go to work, that you have to buy food and cook it if you want to eat it, and that actions have consequences. Adulting is hard because life is hard, or as a hard bustle article admonishes to its readers, everything is hard if you want to look at it that way. Millennials love to complain about other millennials giving them a bad name, but as I fumed about this 27-year-old post of anxiety, I was deep in a cycle of tendency developed over the last five years that I've come to call errand paralysis. I'd put something on my weekly to-do list and I'd roll it over one week to the next, haunting me for months. Now, this kind of article goes on and on to kind of explain, you know, um, the rationale or the kind of reasoning behind some millennials being lazy or whatever. Oh, actually, lazy, I'll take that back because it's an interesting word to kind of build on, but it kind of pissed me off in a sense of like, you know, it, yes, it, you know, millennials do get a bad rap and, you know, I'd kind of, we kind of have to classify myself as a millennial because I think it goes from, is it 88? No, I think it's like 84 to like 96, I think. Date of birth is kind of a uh, millennials, I think so or whatever. The, the the problem I have with this, especially this story with this Tim guy who struggles to kind of get um, his votes off to the mailing room, right? It's just a lack of personal responsibility, isn't it? Because we all know life is hard. We all know we're in a position where everything is kind of, you know, difficult in life and there's loads of challenges in society. But the one thing that we all have to recognize is that we have to take personal responsibility for things, isn't it? Right? You have to take personal responsibility. You have to look at the situation you're in and admit that... Even though, even though there are some extenuating circumstances behind it, wherever you might be in your, in your life, the only way forward is for you to take that responsi responsibility on yourself, to put a burden on your shoulders and figure out a way to overcome it. That's the only thing you can do. If you wait for a handout, if you wait for someone to help you up, you'll be waiting forever or you'll be waiting for basically the lottery, you're waiting for somebody to, you know, to kind of choose you out of 100 people, which is not probably the best thing to do. So you always, always, always have to kind of understand and get to that realization that it's only really up to you. But again, I think what happens with a lot of people is that I think as I've kind of grown up, started to kind of have more sympathy with it, I've realized that that kind of admitting that it's your fault is probably a lot more painful than just standing still for some people. Because admitting it's your only fault will then kind of, fl I don't know, flood back all these memories of all the other times in your life where it's always been, where it has been your fault too. And that will just bum you out forever. But if you somehow trick your brain into just standing still and accepting what is, maybe life will be a little bit more easy. I think that's the rationale behind it. But this article goes on and on to explain it. It's kind of interesting in that respect. So I kind of do um, implore you to kind of read it. But then if you scroll down to the bottom of the article, what kind of annoys me about it? There's a lot of pontificating about why millennials do this, why is that, why it isn't what you think it is, why there's a reason towards it. 
uh, for it, for instance. But there is no um, there is no solution at the end of it. There's no kind of action. There's no kind of thing that you can do in order to overcome it. So let's say I'm a millennial and I do have ADHD and I am quite low low self esteem. I am questioning my place in society. What can I do about it? How can I change? How can I kind of you know pull myself on my, my bootstrap? How can I kind of you know make my family proud? How can I make sure my I don't know, my community has someone that represents them in the right way, whatever it may be. How can I do this? No solution at the end. None. No solution. It just goes on and on, whining, 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 whining. And then right here at the end, uh, da, da, da. it says here at the end, writing this art, writing this, this, this piece, I was orchestrating a move, planning travel, picking up prescriptions, walking my dog, trying to exercise, making dinner, attempting to participate in work conversations on Slack, posting photos on social media and reading the news. I was waking up at 6 a.m. to write, packing boxes over lunch, moving piles of wood at dinner, failing, uh, falling into bed at 9 uh, at nine, um, I was on a treadmill on, on of the to-do list, one damn thing after another. But as I finish this piece, I feel something I haven't felt in a long time. Catharsis. I, fe I feel great. I feel something which is not something I've already felt upon the completion of a task in some time. There, there are still some things to tackle after after this. But for the first time, I'm seeing myself, the parameters of my labor, the cause of my burnout clearly. It doesn't feel like the, the abyss. It doesn't feel hopeless. It's not a problem I can solve, but it's a reality I can acknowledge, a paradigm through which I can understand my actions. It's just weird, isn't it, right? It's not a problem I can solve, but it's a reality I can acknowledge. What does that mean, though? So what, you're going to just leave it up to the universe to kind of just figure it out for you? That makes no sense. It continues. In writing on this, in, uh, in their writing on homelessness, social psychologist De Devin Price has said that laziness, at least in the way most of us generally conceive it, simply does not exist. Imagine imagine right uh, okay it continues if a person's behavior doesn't make sense to you they write it's because you are missing a part of their context it's that simple my behavior didn't make sense to me because i was missing part of my context burnout see already you've got an easy excuse to just pin your hang your coat up on oh i got burnout it's not my fault burnout I was too ashamed to admit it. I was experiencing it. I fancied myself too strong to succumb to it. I had narrowed my definition of burnout to exclude my own behaviors and symptoms, but I was wrong. I think uh, I have some of the answers to specific questions that m made me start writing this essay. Yours are probably somewhat or substantially different. I don't have a plan or action other than to be more honest with myself about why I am and what I'm not doing and why and try to disentangle myself from the idea that everything is good and bad, everything is bad is good. This, is, this isn't a task to complete or a line on a to-do list or even a news resolution. It's a way of thinking about life and what joy and meaning we can derive, not just from optimizing it, but living it, which is another way of saying it's, actually, it's life's actual work. Come on, man. So there's no solution towards this and laziness doesn't exist. This, is, this, this kind of a, a, epitomizes why people hate millennials, right? Like you're trying to create, a, there's a study now where you're analyzing homelessness, which probably isn't the best correlation in terms of just the average everyday folk. Right, because obviously homelessness. I don't think people. I don't think the every. I don't think if people really. Maybe if you're walking past somebody on a really um, crazy Monday morning or Tuesday morning where you hate, you're hating the world, and you don't want to go to work, and you're walking past some uh, guy or girl at Liverpool Street Station and they're homeless and they're begging for money, there might be a little part of you that's like, oh, you're just lazy. Why don't you go up and work, right? But if you really meditate and think on your uh, and think about your thoughts really clearly i don't think the, the most rational human being is really sitting there and really kind of um, has come to a conclusion that people that are homeless or sleeping rough are just lazy i don't think most people think that right but take take homelessness out of the equation and just talk about the general everyday average average everyday person in society right for the most part we are quite lazy we you do procrastinate right we do kind of pontificate on things that we don't take personal responsibility. That is the truth. Laziness is a thing. This is why people get personal trainers. This is why people try and, um, I don't know, um, move their gym closer to their work so they have no excuse but to go there. This is why people, like I was doing before, folding their um, running gear and putting at the end of their bed so that when they wake up, they see their running gear or they're putting their running gear next to their phone. Uh, so when they wake up, they see their phone and to get their phone, they have to go through their running gear. There's all these things people do um, that make it, seem like that make it um that make it seem like you know you are lazy you're acknowledging it and you're trying to uh, construct your environment to kind of combat that laziness because your our default action is just to rest on our laurels right but we have to kind of consistently fight it we're all doing it i'm doing it everyone does it you just consistently do it right so to say laziness doesn't exist is fucking crazy because what it does even if it even if it was a thing i wouldn't want to tell myself that because i'm conveniently giving myself an out i'm giving myself an excuse i'm saying you know what laziness exists Laziness is, is not a thing. 
You just have to have the context towards it. You don't have the context for my actions, so that's why you don't understand what I'm doing. No, no, no. Generally, we all can take, we all can kind of, um, when it comes to stuff like laziness, we can all kind of like take examples we see around us and kind of our own anecdotal stuff that's happening with us and we can kind of come to a conclusion that maybe this person isn't working as hard as they say they're working in order to kind of get where they need to get to we can kind of all kind of assume that for the most part so to say this doesn't exist is fucking nuts nuts and then again there's no solution at the end of it there's no kind of action plan it's just you know i'm going to leave it up to the gods and kind of accept where i am and go from there that's the problem i have with it so if youtube if you're a youtube creator and you're complaining about burnout i think you have to just accept that if you're one of those people that you're on the kind of one million subscriptions of subs um, upwards you have to accept that you are essentially your nickelodeon right you are cbbc you are itv you are channel four you're just one person but you've kind of turned yourself into that people are watching your content more than they're probably watching terrestrial tv but in the same way that terrestrial tv would have programming for like 24 hours a day i don't know seven hours whatever it may be seven days a week you're of that you're in that same sort of category where you kind of have to consistently upload the more you upload and the bigger you are i don't think there's any coincidence that pewdiepie one of the biggest youtubers out there could upload every single day and has a rabid fan base because that's what they've come to expect and also that is what regular terrestrial TV, television was about right every day you'd wake up and you'd watch tom and jerry right essentially PewDiePie is creating his own Tom and De Jerry show every single day without missing a day. And that's essentially what these YouTubers are having to do in their own kind of way. You have to construct your own, obviously, upload schedule, whatever it may be, but I don't think you can kind of hide behind the burnout thing and then, you know, be happy to take all the plaudits because you're part of this new digital age, but then don't want to do the work of the person that was on the terrestrial television. You have to do the same amount of work. It is what it is. Um, so, yeah, this is an interesting article for those of you that want to read it. I recommend you check it out. Um, it's on BuzzFeed News. Um, again, it's a bit it's a bit excuse laden. It's a little bit, you know, it kind of gives everyone an out. But it's maybe an interesting article to kind of, you know, delve a bit deep if you want to understand the millennial mindset. And if you are, maybe want to make sure you don't repeat any of the mistakes of your millennial friends, maybe check it out. It's called How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation. And it's available now on BuzzFeed News. And I'll make sure I'll link it in the bio so you guys can check it out yourselves. What's next here? Da, 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 da. London Fashion Week men's. Oh, yeah. London Fashion Week has kicked off last week. Um, I should have probably realized when I was coming back from my DJ set on the Saturday, I kind of bumped into a couple of friends who were going to shows. I think they were going to go see... Who are they going to go see? Someone. Um, and then a couple of people I saw walking around who looked quite fashionable, uh, more so than people, you know, would look on Bethnal Green. People were usually quite dusty, so people looked quite a bit shiny. People had, the, you know, their blogger clothes on. So I should have kind of assumed that Fashion Week was starting, but I kind of forgot. Came back, looked into Now Fashion, and saw all the shows updating. So that was quite a nice surprise. A couple of shows that I saw that were I was interested in that kind of, you know, tickled me fancy, um, that I kind of always kind of look out for just to get up on your screen so i can kind of run through a couple of collections that i like that i like that i like that i like number one liam hodges a london designer who i don't think gets the credit he probably deserves um i think for the most part he's probably one of the most more interesting creators out there somebody that i've kind of personally known over the years kind of from just hanging out around dawson those kind of areas he's always been about um and just generally a cool dude who makes really interesting clothes i think for the most part and um he presented his full winter collection in london the other day i'm gonna get up here on the screen some very interesting pieces for those of you that are interested so i like this these trousers we've got here in look one sort of like a uh tie-dye effect it looks like right i like that as well with a long sleeve top on it you got the same sort of thing with the with the kind of denim suit here i love the i love what he's done here with the camo if you can see that here it's it looks like it is, it's just tied out too okay when i looked at the pictures earlier i thought it was patched on but it is tied out as well which looks amazing i don't see people do that too often with a camo so he's kind of done it in in patterns or in blocks i'm assuming maybe he's put something to cover the panels or maybe he's done it with a brush he's kind of dipped um bleach on a brush and sort of like brushed it down and those kind of on um, those kind of segments to kind of create this nice little grid frame and you get different sort of like you know tones of camo on there so that's really cool like the look of that um again tracksuits are always a very strong um, motif when it comes to liam hodges loads of great little sportswear uh streetwear kind of pieces on there loads of nice accessories i love what he's done here with the contact lenses here one light one dark that looks really cool 
and just generally like a really nice collection and also like the trainers too there's something here that uh, i think kind of similar to the raf moon boots that were right, a couple seasons ago i think when there's i think it's a, like a visual trick isn't it with shoes where if you kind of make if you kind of make the outsole the midsole and a bit of the foxing a uh, contrasting color to the upper you can kind of create like a weird sort of like duck booty kind of shape feel so you can even do it with converses which are fairly thin you can kind of make the give the illusion that it looks a bit, lot thicker than what it does which looks really cool um again some nice looks here with waistcoats again the sportswear pieces are always very very um interesting i like them into material on these pants here they look very cool and yeah it's, just in general, a very, very cool collection and, and always really cool casting too. I, don't, I think that's something you're always going to see in London, runway shows. You're never going to see the kind of whitewashing that you see in kind of Milan or you kind of see in Paris sometimes regarding, uh, de depending on the designer. The one thing, even though maybe London might be a bit rough on the edges, it might be a bit eccentric, might be a bit wild for some people. What you do see that's something that I do love is that you do see the London streets reflected in the runway. You see the kids that would wear that kind of thing or the, the, the kids that the designer would want to be part of his world reflected into the clothes. And it's always multicultural, it's always multiracial. It just, again, it just represents, without being cliche, without kind of, you know, ticking the quota boxes. It's just a, re a reflection of where they are because most of these designers have studios in really fucked up parts of London because that's the cheapest place where you can get rent and you're passing these people day in, day out. Why not take inspiration from them? Why not kind of put that kind of patina on your mood board instead of kind of having it be completely whitewashed? So it's nice to see in general the kind of, you know, the cast is always interesting. But again, Liam Hodges is always somebody that does it right anyway in that, in that respect. So let me check it out. Again, this, this camera piece, it's so good. I love what he's done here with the with. The, with I'm sh I'm assuming it is dip dyed, uh, or tie dyed. I'm assuming so. I'm not sure how that's done, but that's fucking cool. Army green is. Um, I'm, I might try that with uh, some pants if I get a pair. Army green and just kind of get a brush, dip it in. That would that work? I'm not. I'm not sure if it would, but maybe you'd have to kind of dilute the bleach a little bit more. But yeah, it looks amazing. They've got a nice little Lisi collaboration here. I'm assuming with tracksuit, which looks very interesting. Um, I'm sure that's going to be very successful when that comes out. I'm assuming the shoes are Elise too. They don't look yeah they they are. They got the little um you can see the logo there. So yeah, overall very cool collection from Liam Hodges. So I recommend you check that one out. Again, this is a great look. A tie dye with a with the striped long sleeve looks fucking awesome. So I recommend you check that out very very soon. Again, everything there looks banging. Oh yeah, and again this last this is one of my favorite looks here. This sort of like purple tie-dye suit overall it looks so so cool i'm de we're definitely you're definitely going to see a few artists of your favorite artists that you like wearing that sort of top and again nice sort of logo t-shirts here the martians are coming to save the earth so yeah i recommend you check that out liam hodges is one of my faves there um what else who else did i like here get up on the screen da -da -da -da. Um, oh, e to e I don't know how you pronounce it. E torts, e e twats, e torts. Someone I've always kind of liked the look of the shoes, and and, and like, um, well, the collection. I like the shoes in this collection overall. Um, so is, is it e t a u t z? I'm not sure how you pronounce that. E torts, e but I like the I like this collection very, very, very much. Just because um, I forgot who it was. Uh, what collect? Who what designer was it? It might have been Jill Sander. It might have been somebody else, but. I remember seeing this sort of like um, aesthetic before on a runway collection, especially with men's. I love the, I love when runway show, especially with designers kind of uh, fuck around with their idea of masculinity, right? So I love the idea like you've got maybe these kind of feminine kind of floaty shapes and then you kind of contrast them with these little thin, uh, what would you call them? Arabian slippers, these kind of like slim, really kind of slipper sock thing with contrasting socks on it or tights that look so, so amazing. It looks so comfy, so cozy. Like that look here with the suit jacket and the plum pants and the black shoes, the contrasting sock just looks amazing. You've got this amazing look with the over, great overcoat, a uh, checkered overcoat, double breasted, like just, just a very an amazing look, right? So I don't know what the shoe, but I forgot who did the collection. But it reminded me of like um, there's a particular dancer. I forgot his name. He's like a Russian ballerina, very very famous. He wrote a couple of books, or a couple of books have been written about him. He kind of think super young. Forgot his name, and he kind of have same similar sort of look. I remember someone based their collection on him. Sort of again, maybe similar to like Haida Haida Aikman in that regard, where he sort of like loads of high waisted trousers to kind of really kind of accentuate the waist. And again, to kind of bring out the shoulders or the really drapey shoulder lengths there. But just in general, I love the kind of questioning on the masculinity. Like this look is looks amazing, right? White, white linen, linen. I'd say I'm not sure if it's linen. Maybe it's linen. Maybe it's not. 
the white pants just looks amazing sort of like drop coach but a little bit higher waisted I, I forgot what that mod what that model is called but they, these looks just look very very nice very cozy um again so i recommend you check that out too one of my favorites so far i've seen london he taughts he twats he taughts he tweets twats twats how you pronounce it i'm not sure how you pronounce it but yeah this is one of my favorite collections so far that i've seen overall again just messing around with the idea of of, of masculinity so it's very um it's very feminine in some regards but also very masculine in some regards again let's just look at the color palette here that's one thing i love with runway shows that i always try and do even if i if i can't maybe afford the clothes themselves i try and just take um the color palettes and kind of adopt them into my wardrobe because sometimes you know we all have great outfits in our wardrobe but we can't necessarily piece them together in the right way you know so um, working with you know designers usually work with like world-class stylists and they kind of are able to kind of uh, put their looks together in some in some really really creative way but i just love the color palette so you've got this green overcoat um you've got a blue oxford kind of shirt and then you've got these nice blue pants uh pleated at the front right and then they kind of drop down quite low on the shoes black with like contrasting socks just those colors in general blue uh tones of blue and green all kind of in that same sort of patina looks amazing right just looks so so cool Again, nice color palettes. Again, another one here, on, especially on black skin. You've got this nice tartan overcoat with a plum red shirt inside. And nice, they look like corduroy trousers there. And again, the same look here too. Like a den blue denim jacket, some green pants. Like you could easily change this for a, a, de a an usual denim look. You might have your wardrobe. You might have a, a denim jacket in your wardrobe. You might have some green chinos from Dickies. You might have some Vans or Converse lying around that are red. You throw on a white t-shirt. You've got yourself a nice little look that you didn't know you had in your wardrobe. So again, that's why I recommend checking out runway shows because you can always steal the color palettes there. So that was another one of my favorites. And then there was a couple more too that I liked as well. I'll quickly check out here that I've seen. And I think a Cold War showing as well. That should be coming up in a couple of hours, I think, actually. if um, After this podcast, they'll probably finish. They, they will come up too. But let me try and quickly scan through now fashion and see what else I liked. I think it might have been John Lawrence that I thought was super, super cool. Ashley Anderson had a really nice collection too. Probably one of the, the, my favorites of hers that I've seen in a long, long while. Um, again, Chalayan, uh, Kiko... Kozinstadinov, how you pronounce his name, he did a very good collection too, but it's always quite cool in that regard. Um, but let me pick out something interesting that I thought was really nice. Oh, my my buddy, my my one of my favorites there. I'll be taking my oh that's the one my friend saw. Okay, so um Nicholas they went to go see Nicholas Daly. A couple of a couple of my mates know him personally, so they went to go see his show, um, which I think was on the Saturday actually. So that was um when people went to go see. But these are the last two I'm going to show that I thought were my interesting favourites. I'm gonna pick from the, the first couple of days of London Fashion Week. Number one is Charles uh Charles Jeffrey, lover boy. Charles Jeffrey I met when I used to work in Somerset House for a company I was working through there, like startup there. Um he had a studio next door to our studio or maybe upstairs. And um again he just uh, I think if you've ever been in a London scene or you've ever been in any sort of like, you know, main city scene around the world, especially when it comes to fashion, especially if your city has a reputation, usually the people that are associated with that scene can kind of be a little bit up their own ass, right? Um, be, um, sometimes rightfully so, because, you know, they've, they've been getting loads of applauded, they've been featured in magazines, people are on their, on their, on them for the most part, they're getting brand sponsorship deals, they're talk of the town, right? Everyone kind of wants to be them. They've got intern requests coming out of their ass, right? It, sometimes you can... I understand why you sometimes can, you know, think your shit doesn't stink. I get it. But then sometimes in in the scene too, you can get surprised and you can sometimes be bumped into somebody who has the world at their feet, who's obviously very talented, but also super cool. And Charles Jeffrey was one of them. Somebody that I kind of always had my eye on beforehand. And then when I kind of realized that he was working next door, I was kind of trying to contain my inner fanboy. And then when we had a Christmas party at Somerset House for, you know, all the kind of studios that are there, I kind of got speaking to him and we kind of had started like kind of, you know, just exchanging um, compliments. And I was complimenting him more so than he was complimenting me. But he just came across as a really cool dude, super nice, super chill. And obviously since then, I've kind of always kept my eye on him and seen what he's done. And as, as of late, his work has just progressed and got better and better and better. I'm assuming with, you know, better access to manufacturing, his clothes just look even more refined than before. But the real treat was working in the studio next door and seeing him kind of designing in real life out loud. He used to kind of get his friends come in as fit models to kind of wear some of the 
weird and crazy creations that he makes in terms of overcoats and pieces and art pieces and you see it made in real life and you're like fuck this is amazing he's getting all his friends to come in and do it and, um the sum the somerset studio house somerset studio um somerset house studios that we were in had this kind of like gangway and used to kind of make his um fit models walk down and like kind of quote quote unquote um make sure run away that he had outside of his studio so you got to see that stuff in real life which is a real real privilege so again someone that i've always kind of been a big fan of and he's kind of showed his full wind collection too and again it just, it just keeps building keeps getting better and better and better and i think over time we're going to see um charles um jeffrey kind of you know eventually kind of seeping into the mainstream if it hasn't already uh, in the first place so this is his um uh for winter collection i'll get up here on the screen go back to the looks here it's annoying when now fashion does that it kind of auto plays the looks which is annoying it's really annoying when it kind of has a the main look you want on the left hand side but hey ho what can you do so um loved all the looks for the most part i love that he was always kind of harking back to his scottish roots scotland right loads of tartan included there i love the fact that he's always kind of wearing kilts as well at the end of the shows but what really stood out for me is obviously the tartan looks for the men's looks are look probably some of the best stuff i've seen in a while um i think easily this logo lover boy i'm sure he hasn't done it because he probably doesn't want to be a logo heavy dude but if you got that printed on a shirt on a hoodie um and he had it fit a particular way maybe had a second couple of compartments maybe it was, i don't know glittery i think he'd sell these things like hot cakes like lover boy in the front of a shirt would just look so so cool um so yeah this tartan suit looks amazing but what really stands out for me is the shoes i love the shoes the shoes is amazing all the footwear in this collection looks fucking a banging i'm not sure if it's a collaboration i'm not sure what if this kind of stuff is always made in-house but the shoes look fucking sick in every, in every look that I've seen so far, those are my standout, I think, so far. And obviously some of the accessories, but the shoes look are probably the most best thing here. I love this earring here on the side as well. Is that an earring or is that something that's on uh, hanging off the hat? I'm not sure, sure. But yeah, looks are just incredible as always. All the men's look kind of mixed in with a few women's looks too. Again, uh, loads of tartan here, loads of chains. The boots, the shoes just look really cool. Um, again, just like really interesting looks. I love this suit here. It looks incredible. And again, just this look, it just looks so nice, no? Head to toe. Something that if I was nice, I'd easily wear. Go, stay away from all that Gucci shit. Support somebody that's local. And look at this. This is amazing. And the boots too. I just love the look of these. They just they, they kind of look like hippo, hip, hippo feet, right? Or walled feet. I love it. Like square toe. I'm a big, I think there was a, was it a Margiela boot or somebody made a boot recently, like a Chelsea boot that had like an ex like a exaggerated rectangle square toe. I really like that, especially coming from, you know, the past era so far, where everyone's been kind of really pointy as per usual in the toes. I kind of like the exaggerated square toe, which I think would work really well if they would decide to do it, which I don't see, I'm not sure Nike would ever do it, but if Nike ever decided to do like a designer range or Air Force Ones, right? I think they could easily do a, an Air Force One tabby boot. I like take inspiration from the, from the tabby from Margiela. And I could easily think they could do exaggerated shapes. Like, you know how um, Comme des Garçons did the massive toy in the front of the Air Force One. Imagine just a really squared off Air Force One shape, like exaggerated. So maybe underneath, as you're wearing it, it looks it's the same, but there might be a little pocket around the front that makes it look completely squared off. I think that would look super sick. But again, this look looks amazing. I love this look with a jumper uh, tucked, into the, tucked into the kilt amazing too with no pleats as well which is nice little look there a couple of uh, little slit here on the side but looks nice overall and chain detail there again nice look for the men's nice bit of bondage there with the with the ropes all over the jacket we could say for the most part again a nice little outfit there overcoat with the nice boots just the footwear is just incredible in the whole collection, I think. Probably my stand-up piece. I love the look with the tartans and the socks pulled up. The socks are amazing, actually. Love boy socks. They look fucking awesome. They look really, really cool. And again, nice boots. This is probably my favorite look. This tartan overcoat just looks splendid with a massive silver chain. Looks like on the front here. Maybe that's a uh, fastening detail. Again, the boots, the shoes just look incredible. I love the shoes so, so much. Again, just great, great looks overall. One of my favorite London designers by far, uh, Charles Jeffrey. I love a boy. Recommend you check that out. Full winner collection, just absolutely insane. Look at this headpiece here. So cool. Um, overall, one of my favorite pieces. One of my favorite collections. Out. Again, these jumpers just look so good. Again, color palettes. Even if you probably can't afford the entire look or get the whole entire look, I just love that as a color palette, right? Those that stripy jumper, blue, red and black, nice high waisted uh grey pants. I love the detail here. Contrast stitching is coming back. Big up uh Phoebe Philo um for that as well. 
Lover Boy t-shirts here. So loads of graphic. Maybe so, some graphic tees are coming in. I like that belt too. It looks really nice. Um, nice little detail there as well, actually, with the tartan thing hanging off the side of the trousers. So yeah, I can't wait to see um, what the stores buy of these actually collection. I'm not sure if everything's going to go into production. Hopefully it does. But again, the shoes. Look at the shoes. Look at the shoes. Look at the shoes. With the, is that a massive zip on the front? I'm not too sure. That just looks amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. All good. So yeah, check out, I recommend you check it out. Charles Jeffrey Lover Boy, one of my favorite collections so far of uh, London Men's Fashion Week. Um, and again, there is the main man there himself. Always looks incredibly dapper. I think that's another thing too. I want to go back to the era of designers that look incredible in their own clothes, that wear their own collections, right? Wear your stuff, man. Look, look how it look. He's, he's the perfect, he's the perfect ambassador for Lover Boy. Look at look how it look good it looks on him. It's like um, um Alessandro Michele, the, the guy for Gucci. When he comes out at the end, he probably one of the best dressed people wearing Gucci every day because he looks amazing in his own clothes. Charles Jeffrey is in that same vein. And then last but not least, my other um, my other favorite I thought was really, really good collection was John Lawrence. He did an amazing collection, I think, where he had um, a band play. I forgot the name of the band. What was a band that was playing for the John Lawrence show? Uh, damn, forgot the name of the band. But anyway, um, there was a band playing as well during during the performance of the show. Um, but I, I love the looks overall. It reminded me a lot of like old school Heidi. At 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 Corey Dior, maybe some, uh, maybe a little little bit of number nine, maybe a little bit of soloist involved. Um, I just love that aesthetic in general. So yeah, I recommend you check this out too. John Lawrence for winter, loads of nice looks, loads of snakeskin, loads of leopard, um, loads of cheetah. Just an amazing, amazing collection. Loads of things that shouldn't really go together, going together really well. Um, again, just pure filth. Love it. Love everything about it. Again, great footwear, massive boots looks like this look just look incredible nice cheetah overcoat leather pants derby boots just looks incredible all of it so and again casting just amazing this is where it is where you see london show just looks a very interesting casting level and again look look at this look with a nice jumper with it looks is it like is it pvc is that satin not too sure with these boots as well again it's just i love the blending of the femininity and the masculinity right with the eyeshadow and the way that guy looks kind of semi-androgynous, the, the jumper, especially with the contrasting, with the color blocking here towards the bottom, kind of looks like it's cropped, but it's not cropped. These pants and then tucked into his really aggressive army boots just looks amazing, amazing, amazing. All together, one of my favorite collections out so far in London Fashion Week. So again, recommend you check these all out. All available on nowfashion.com. That's why I usually check out all my runway shows because Vogue looks a bit annoying since style.com disappeared. Vogue Fashion Week runways I'm not really a fan of. So recommend you check out now. Press now Fashion updates all their collections really quickly as well when they're out. So recommend you check that out. Again, another favorite look here. You could easily get something like this in the high street if you looked hard enough. Um, you could easily get this maybe in a vintage shop. This sort of like top again, copy the looks, but um, just in general, uh, expert styling, man. One of my favorite collections. So you've got sort of like a cheetah sort of print here, top, I think, for the most part, or lion top. And then these nice leather pants, boots again. So it looks like a lot of boots are going to be coming back. Chelsea boots, lots of big rugged boots. No more pointy toes, sort of like Saint Laurent white boots are kind of in fashion. Everyone's sort of doing really chunky uh, Chelsea boots, which is a nice little change from regular schedule programming. It's recommended again, you check that out. John Lawrence. Oh yeah, um, that was a band that was playing, Wild Daughter. They were playing towards the, the side as well, the collection. There's the main the head designer there. Looks incredible as per usual. Again, recommend you check that out. John Lawrence for Winter Collection. That's my runway pick so far. Anyway, so let's get back to other topics here. What else have I got to show you? Du, 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 du. Oh, Ryanair were voted the worst airline for the sixth year in a row. Anyone surprised? Good. <laughs> so this article came out the other day. That Ryanair for the sixth year running has been voted the worst budget airline, I'm assuming, right? For the most part. Now, you know, that's a fairly unfair statement to make, you know, because Ryanair doesn't purport to be, you know, the world's best airline in the world for the most part. But anyone that's been on a Ryanair flight, I think you can kind of attest, you know, to how horrible the experience is. But for the most part, I think they do a pretty good job considering the amount of places people have to go and stuff, bro. Right? I'll get this article up here, right now. Right now, it's one that loading for some reason. Right now, rated uh, worst. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, short haul, that's why. So, this article is on Sky, but it's not coming up on the Sky website. Doesn't matter. 
So this article says as follows. Um, get up here on the screen. Uh -huh. Ryanair named worst short haul airline. Uh, Ryanair has won the dubious honour of the world of the UK's least liked short haul airline for the six year running. The results from the which survey of airline passengers ranked Ryanair as the bottom of nineteen carriers to fly from the UK. The top five were Guernsey based um, Ori Origin Origin Air Service, Swiss Airlines, Jet Two, Norwegian Dutch carrier KLM. A Ryanair spokesman said the airline's success was not reflected by the survey. The UK's other large airlines, EasyJet and British Airways, coming at 11th and 15th, respectively, in their survey. EasyJet beat Brighton British Airways score for food and drink, customer services. Really? Okay. People prefer EasyJet's food and drink to British Airways. Really? Okay. Because um, it beat scores for food and drink, customer service and value for money, but both received low ratings for their seat comfort. Okay. Ryanair faced strike action in 2018, cancelled flights but refused to offer passengers compensation and reduction of new baggage rules uh, three times. Yeah, that's that, that's that been an annoying one. The airline which pre precedes it, it will carry 140, 141 million passengers this year also left passengers unimpressed with its boarding process, seat comfort and food and drink offering. The boarding process isn't too bad, to be honest, for the most part, right? You just get into the, get into the different lines, um, depending if you reserve the seat or not. It's not that shabby, I don't think, for the most part. Um, I'm surprised that people... Huh. But the baggage rules are interesting because I think someone that I know recently threw it right there and I, make, I think beforehand you could always take a free kind of like... You know, you could always take your luggage with you to go into the carry-on for free in the room. But now if you want to have your luggage in the overhead um, luggage compartments, you have to get you have to pay for it. Um, and also, you know, reserved seating is probably you have to pay for as well. But now even even to put your luggage in a hold, you have to pay for it. So regardless, if you bring luggage in an airline, you have to pay, um, which I didn't know was a thing. Um, you can obviously bring a backpack. Now they're charging for literally everything. Um, I've never bought food on a Ryanair flight because I'm not a fucking psycho, right? I'll just pack a lunch or I'll buy an expensive pret a sandwich at the airport, right? Why is it, again, pret a is was well, super expensive in the airport, but here's what it is. I'd rather pay for that than buy the food on the airline, especially those fucking toasties that they're microwaving up, like, what, thousands of feet up in the air. Probably not the best thing for your health. Um, so, yeah, I'm surprised that people voted that. Um, but it, as it continues, which, um, which said thousands of responses, respondents said that they would never fly with the airline again. Of those surveyed who chose the airline, that they would never fly in the future. 70% chose Orion. However, independent aviation consultant Chris Terry says, um, despite the low satisfaction ratings, customers were still happy enough to fly with the Irish budget airline. Ryanair still represents a great value for the huge amount of people. What they receive is what they respect. Exactly. That's what I say. Because for the most part, Ryanair is quite dodgy. It's quite shitty. But for me, whilst I live in Stratford, my nearest airline airport is Stansted, which is like an hour away in a bus um, on the coach, sorry. Uh, maybe 45 minutes on a good day uh, you can get a train a Heath uh, Stansted Express from Liverpool Street that gets you there for about 25 minutes if you're lucky to get Liverpool Street to here it's like 50 minutes so it's not too bad you can always you could get there quite soon so I, and, I, and again I don't mind the airport I think some people don't like the airport they prefer Heathrow I kind of don't mind the airport and essentially you do know what you're getting on the tin you do know exactly what you're getting you know exactly what the service is going to be like and for the most part, it's not too shabby. Some of the newer, some of the newer right, right now, planes with the kind of thinner seats are a bit more comfortable than the old school ones with a massive like yellow plastic thing on the back of the or back of the covers. Um, it's not probably the best to carry. I've realized that on a Ryanair flight, because the seats are so tight together, it's probably not the best place to even take a MacBook Air, Air that I have, even like this. It doesn't really fit that well when you're trying to watch a movie, so it might be only beneficial to have an iPad, something I haven't, I've been thinking about getting for a while. But if you probably want to watch movies, probably bring an iPad with you, not bring a laptop, because it's not really going to fit on the on the screen covers that you're just sitting down. Um, and all in all, it's, it's a fairly um innocuous experience i kind of like it i'm not really that bothered about it and again it's super super cheap um you can go to most of the locations in europe and yeah i quite like right now man I, I think they do a, a pretty stellar job all things considered it could be better right don't get me wrong they could do a better job and maybe overall service sometimes they do that annoying thing most budget airlines do it because i'm assuming they have to kind of you pay really maybe you're on the you're on the clock when you're taxing your airplane but sometimes i've been at the airport one time i went to the airport I don't know, as i usually do an hour and a half ahead of time i got a drink i went to the bar I went to weatherspoons have a beer whatever maybe sitting down loads of time my gate number hadn't come up i kind of lost track of time a little bit and then when i look back up again 45 minutes later it said that my gate was about to close so i had to down my drink which is already a, a beer run um i don't know 
eight hundred meters, however much it is, to get to this, to get to the gate because you you don't realize when you're in the airport just how far from the place of kind of entertainment the gates are usually. Ran all the way, sprinted to the fucking gate, sweating my ass off, getting a stitch because I had drunk in a fucking full pint. And then by the time I get there, there's a massive queue and only the people that reserve their seats are getting on board. And that's obviously my inexperience because I didn't, I wasn't aware of what was going on. I was maybe in a panicked rush, but they do that quite often. It's like, you know, the gate gets announced and within 10 minutes of it getting announced, all of a sudden the gates are about to close. No, they're not. They're not about to close. You're going to take another 45 minutes to maybe an hour to get people on that train and I mean, on a plane and get people seated and all that stuff, malarkey, make sure everyone's there and then you're going to fly off. So it's not that much a window, but they always do that. And I'm sure maybe there's a reason to do it to get people who might be at the gate, but that's something that I don't really like in that respect. Um, but for the most part, everything else is fairly easy, good process. The person at the gate takes your ticket, scans you through, you get your seat, you sit down. No, it's a fairly innocuous experience. If anything, the, the annoying part of budget airlines is the people that you meet on the planes, right? The person that holds up the entire queue, deciding what what kind of compartment they want to put their bag in. The inconsiderate person that's, you know, have a kid that's screaming and not trying to calm him down. The person that stands up 70 million times to go to the toilet. Like, those people are the ones that are annoying, but for the most part, the airline, I think, is fairly, fairly cool. But again, budget airline, no surprise, it got a low rating from people in society overall. Probably not fans of it, but hey, what can you do? That's what budget airlines are for, man. Takes you places. If anything, the one experience I had with Ryanair that was really shocking was maybe to go to Frankfurt when I went to Robert Johnson, the world famous um, techno club in Frankfurt. When you leave Stanford to go to Frankfurt, it stops at some other Frankfurt airport. Um, it maybe is the equivalent distance of like maybe. Heathrow or Gatwick or some shit. I didn't know that. So you have to take that. You take that plane to that place, which is really cheap. So the flight to London to Frankfurt must be like sixty pounds. Ah, oh, I'm in a win. But then you have to take another coach to Frankfurt to the six cents. It was another hour, which is fucking insane. So that's the only part I have an issue with. It. And then sometimes the departure times. Um, they usually some destinations, especially the popular ones, might only have two or three flights a day. When you might want a few more, maybe is maybe that's maybe a little bit. Un I'm being a little bit crazy there, thinking that. But sometimes that can be annoying. There could be sometimes there's two flights in the morning really close together there's like a flight that leaves at 8 45 and the flight leaves at like 9 30 and then after that is one that leaves at 4 p.m and that's it so maybe you want it spread out a little bit more but overall i'm a big fan of riding I don't, I don't really mind it and that's per usual like those kind of places man you book a cheap flight you pay for your luggage to get in you pay for your reserve seat to make sure you don't sit in the middle um and or, or you get an aisle seat in a window seat and then you just go ahead of time and make sure you're not late and everything else is kind of works itself out i think so in my opinion anyway Anyway, that's an hour. This is the Zinger Show episode number 140. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been an absolute pleasure to have the company of you for the last hour or so. I'm going to be back again tomorrow for another barnstorming episode. Upload, upload, and you know, update on the old dietary needs and the old workout stuff and what it may be. Hope you have a great rest of the week. As always, I always say, like, don't look forward to weekends. Enjoy the week. Um, work hard at whatever you're doing, you know enjoy the moment be present with malarkey and then when the weekend comes along you'll be like oh surprise it's the weekend but you know don't dread it mondays are fucking amazing enjoy your mondays i'll see you guys again tomorrow for another bantle episode with that malarkey um all updates regarding moi check that out excellentzinger.com as always this podcast is brought to you by audible link to the re reference link or referral link down below it's just audible.com for us aggie audible.com for us aggie to get one free book credit and one and a 30 day free trial do that support the guy so i can buy more books and i'll see you guys again tomorrow for another barn swimming show peace